Ladies and gentlemen, the content patch returns for the 4th of April 2013. My name is Total Biscuit with today's gaming news and comments. Coming up in the show, Disney shuts down LucasArts a few months after acquiring the company. Ouya releases its launch title list and seems to be lacking some killer apps. And the StarCraft II World Championship Series has been announced by Blizzard. Well, unfortunately, it seems like the rumors were true. The acquisition of LucasArts by Disney, along, of course, with Lucasfilm and the Star Wars brand, has resulted in the shutdown of the LucasArts studio. The statement from Disney claimed that after evaluating our position in the games market, we've decided to shift LucasArts from an internal development to a licensing model, minimizing the company's risk while achieving a broader portfolio of quality Star Wars games. As a result of this change, we've had layoffs across the organization. We are incredibly appreciative and proud of the talented teams who have been developing our new titles. But you don't have a job anymore, GG. Ooh, ouch. Well, that's pretty big news for a rather large number of different reasons. So the first reason, of course, is they kill LucasArts. Where'd it go? That's terrible, right? Well, yeah, I mean, there's really no other way to put it. It's a fairly famous studio. It's got a long storied history, and now it's essentially just a licensing firm, and all of the development talent one has to assume has been gotten rid of. They weren't specific as to how many people they laid off or whether there's going to be any development talent left there whatsoever for, say, consulting reasons or liaising with the third-party firms that will supposedly be dealing with the Star Wars titles. But one way or the other, I don't see this being a good thing in any way, simply and just because so many talented people lost their jobs. And that in itself is absolutely dreadful. This also means that the future of Star Wars 1313, which was the forthcoming third-person shooter, which was actually looking not dreadful, is rather uncertain. Disney spoke to Polygon on the issue and stated that it was looking at other options for releasing the game now that LucasArts will not be behind development any longer. What this also means, of course, is that IPs like Day of the Tentacle and Grim Fandango these are the kind of things that will be held on to by Disney, and the chances of there being a new game in that series are fairly slim, even slimmer than they used to be. And even if there was, well, who would they farm it out to? Who would they give that IP to? And do they even care more to the point? We really don't know. This was perhaps the worst case scenario, I feel, when this first happened. We were kind of worried that it would go this way. We were hoping that Disney was a little bit more forward-thinking, but apparently not. However, however, let me play devil's advocate on the subject of this for the moment and say to you this. How many great titles has LucasArts exactly released over the past few years? More to the point, how many titles has it developed itself? without the help of other studios, where it was essentially in a consulting and supervisory role. Because the last game it released, which is depressing as hell I might add, was Angry Birds Star Wars, which was developed by Rovio, not LucasArts. They were involved in it in some way, but it is Rovio's game. Then Connect Star Wars, developed by Terminal Reality, with supervision from LucasArts. Lego Star Wars 3 The Clone Wars, developed by Traveler's Tales, not LucasArts. Star Wars The Old Republic, developed by Bioware. Star Wars The Force Unleashed 2. That was the last game that LucasArts actually made, legitimately made themselves. Yeah, that was a LucasArts-developed game. And you keep going back and you find plenty of other examples of this. Talk about as far back as 2006 and even further back than that. Lego Star Wars came out in 2005. Empire at War 2006, that was made by Petroglyph. Original Star Wars Battlefront in 2004, made by Pandemic. It goes on and on and on. Here's the reality of the situation. And I know this is crushing for a lot of people because I think people have an absolutely wonderful view of LucasArts and they look at it through rose-tinted spectacles and go all the way back, of course, to the days of Sam and Max, the days of Full Throttle and Dark Forces, those kind of games. And they say, oh, wow, what a great studio. In reality, LucasArts hasn't done anything worthwhile in quite some time. Many years. I mean, for God's sake, Force Unleashed 2, that game was not very good. I'm sorry, it's true. The original Force Unleashed in 2008, 
arguably it was a pretty decent game, but it was hardly something that would set the world on fire. It was not exactly all that well received. We had spin-offs of Battlefront that didn't end up working very well, like Republic Heroes, Elite Squad, Mobile Squadrons, for God's sake. I mean, hell, one of their only pieces of original IP was Lucidity, and that wasn't very good, and that came out in 2009. It, it was a nice art style, but the game itself just wasn't very good at all. I've got to be honest here, and this might, again, sound crushing. I don't think LucasArts really had the chops to develop anymore. There's been very little proof in the last five plus years that they are capable of developing on their own good games. The reality is that the last really good game that LucasArts actually made was Star Wars Republic Commando in 2005. Since then, there has not been a single game that they have personally developed which I would consider to be a good game. They have at best achieved average, and that's really about it. And that's not what you expect from LucasArts. So I have to wonder if this even changes a damn thing. If all of these games have been farmed out to third-party developers, and some of them, like, say, Battlefront, ended up being absolutely phenomenal, then while it's clearly a bad thing for the people employed at the studios, is it actually a bad thing for gamers? Does this mean we get worse games? Does this mean we get shovelware? Potentially, yes, it does. But potentially, no, it doesn't. And that's the weird thing about this decision, is that you can't really call how this is going to end up. Star Wars 1313, where would they send that to? Well, they can really send that to pretty much anybody as far as I'm concerned. 1313 was being developed by LucasArts. Was an Unreal 3 engine game? Could it be given to somebody else? Yes, it actually could. Could it be completed by someone else and have it not suck? By the looks of it, yes, it probably could. That's very much a possibility. And who knows where the guys from LucasArts end up. Those developers may end up on different teams that end up actually dealing with this title. And then one of the future. I mean, how many companies have actually made Star Wars games over the past 10 plus years? A lot of companies. Simple as that. And some of them have done a pretty damn good job. Unfortunately, Pandemic doesn't exist anymore, but Traveler's Tales certainly did. Bioware, some might argue that they did a piss poor job on the Old Republic, but last I checked, Knights of the Old Republic was pretty good. Obsidian, Knights of the Old Republic 2, also very, very good. Petroglyph with Empire at War, not terrible. I say that because it had a, its fair share of problems, but it certainly wasn't a bad game by any stretch of the imagination. The fact of the matter is that it is entirely possible that this could be a good thing. I don't think LucasArts has a proven track record over the last eight or so years. Even further back than that, in fact. The golden days of LucasArts are long behind us, and indeed the people responsible for that are with other companies now. We're talking about Ron Gilbert, we're talking about Tim Schafer. These guys aren't with LucasArts anymore. So you can't really attribute that success to what LucasArts was at the end of its lifespan. I guess the really depressing thing about this was that 1313 was looking really good and might have been that title to really put LucasArts back on the map saying, hey, look, well, yeah, we actually can make good Star Wars games or just good games in general. We are entirely capable of still pulling that kind of magic out of the hat. And now, unfortunately, we'll never know. If 1313 is a success, then a lot of people will attribute it to whatever development house actually gets a hold of it and finishes the thing off, assuming it actually gets picked up at all. If it disappears into the ether, then of course it will be the sad and sorry quiet farewell of what was once a legendary development house. The Ouya, the Oh Yeah, the Eeyore as I like to call it, has a launch lineup, quite the launch lineup in fact, a rather large list of 104 games, which will actually launch with the console. The console itself has been arriving at the homes of Kickstarter backers over the last few days. Official launch is currently set for June the 4th. The main problem with this list, of course, is that it's really lacking a killer app. One of the standout titles, of course, being Final Fantasy III, a game which is a couple of decades old now, and as a direct result is likely not to thrill people across the board. There's also Guiana Sisters, which again is a great game on PC. God of Blades, which is pretty damn awesome. A couple of other examples of good stuff, which include Oregon Trail, a 8-bit parody on the Oregon Trail, which is currently also available on PC, and a few emulators, which are perhaps going to be some of the most interesting. Now, what I did notice down here, which is quite intriguing, is the fact that the ball appears to be there. Now, the ball is an Unreal 3-powered game, so that I'm particularly curious as to how well that ends up performing 
on the Ouya system, which is, of course, Tegra 3 powered. Mm. The problem is, of course, there's really not a huge amount of amazing stuff here. But the question is, does there have to be a huge amount of amazing stuff? I've been thinking about this for the past few days. I've been talking an awful lot about how I like the notion that Android is being translated into a more traditional format in terms of the control method and the interface applied to gaming. The problem with mobile gaming right now is that it is so touch orientated and that actually affects everything because you're talking about playing on a portable device, basically a phone, that doesn't have a keyboard, has no real controls or anything like that unless you're playing on an Xperia Play or something along those lines, or you have something like a MOGA or a game clip and a controller. And as a result, the vast majority of games are designed in such a way that you can activate and control them with touch, which is an inherently inaccurate control method, which shuts down an awful lot of different genres. It makes them really not play well at all. Virtual controls on a phone for something like a third-person or first-person shooter is disastrous. And as a direct result, you have to fundamentally change the way your game is designed. The mechanics have to be completely altered. Now, what this also means is that a lot of these games are quite short, or more to the point, the play sessions are designed to be short. We're talking about games that can take one or two minutes of time. We're talking about games to be played on the toilet. We're talking about games to be played while waiting for the bus, while on the bus, while waiting for your next class to start, and so on and so forth. That is what they're designed for. They are not designed for extended play. And of course, why would they be? We're talking about small screens. We're talking about something that's inherently uncomfortable. We're also talking about nuking the battery life on a device which serves more purposes than just gaming. So, you don't want to design games that take a huge amount of time. However, if you start to design games for Android, which are based on the notion that they're going to be played on the EOR, they're going to be played on the Shield, they're going to be played on the Game Clip, and numerous other devices coming at us over the next couple of years, then you might think, huh, alright, well, Android in and of itself is just an operating system, right? Yes, it is. It's just another OS. Do you have the power to make decent games on this thing with a Tegra 3? Eh, potentially. If you're not too concerned about graphical fidelity, I mean, you're talking about games that don't really look like current PlayStation 3 quality games. Maybe, just maybe, they're kind of getting to the point of looking like old school Xbox 360 games. So stuff like Cameo, for instance, or Perfect Dark Zero. You can get games with that kind of fidelity now. That's possible. Because, you know, back then, those games looked amazing, but now they look absolutely terrible. Relatively speaking. However, those games are still functional. They're still playable. I wouldn't say that Perfect Dark Zero is a particularly good game, but Cameo is not bad. And just all the games around that kind of time frame that I'd be using it as, as an example there. And even then, do you really need your games to look amazing? Not necessarily assuming they're interesting. The problem with a lot of Android games and iOS games is a lot of them are throwaways. They're one-button wonders. They're stuff to not really be thought about too deeply because they're just not all that fantastic. So the question is... Can these Android consoles and gaming devices actually encourage good development? Maybe, maybe not. Looking at the fact that there are emulators available for this thing, it looks like there's a SNES emulator, there is an NES emulator, and an N64 emulator available on launch. It seems like these things may be used as cheap $99 emulation machines. Tegra 3 is powerful enough to emulate up to about an N64. You might get PlayStation games running on that as well, original PlayStation that is. Not too bad. Admittedly, you can do most of that on a PSP as well, so it's not exactly impressive but it's nice and easy to do it on the Ouya considering that you don't have to mod it or anything along those lines. So perhaps people buy it for that. But as far as I'm concerned, this system really is designed for low-income families and students. As weird as it sounds. And it does sound weird because the other half of the demographics like hackers, tinkerers, and people that want an emulation box or an HTPC, a nice cheap media box for their front room. But I think it's okay to be marketing something towards lower income people. That's totally fine. It's 60 bucks for a game is expensive. You can say, oh, well, you could buy a, an old DS for $99. Yeah, but the games are still $30 to $40 each. So that's fairly expensive compared to a console which is designed very much around the notion that every single thing on it has a free-to-play trial and every single thing on it is pretty cheap. Then at that point, you've got to say, huh, well, yeah, actually, I, I can see the market for this. The question is, can they actually actively market it? Can they sell it to the people they're supposed to be selling it to? And the answer is, that's going to be tricky, unless you actually get some marketing going for this thing. I've heard very little about this outside of, say, Reddit, which has had a hate jerk on it for the past six months, which is not exactly useful PR. 
But then again, Reddit was never really the target demographic, was it? You want to sell it to the people that just can't afford $60 games. And that's fine. That's actually a really good business model. I like that a lot. I love the idea that there would be a tier below the current consoles or even the next gen and PC where you can play and buy and just enjoy cheaper games. Well, what the hell's wrong with that? And the answer is, there's nothing wrong with that at all. I mean, you can look down your nose, the PC gaming master race if you like, but hell, you know, I own a ridiculously expensive PC, but I can definitely see the appeal of having a $99 console with cheap and easily accessible games. So maybe it'll pull that off, maybe it won't, but hey, turns out the Ouya was not a scam. It's a real thing, it exists, and you're going to be able to buy it pretty soon. The question is, would you as the core gamer demographic want to? Probably not. And finally, the StarCraft II World Championship Series 2013 has been announced, with Blizzard investing a $1.7 million prize pool into the series of events that will be run over the course of 2013, as well as providing extensive funding and logistical support to various tournament organizations. The StarCraft II World Championship Series essentially is a set of three regional leagues, South Korea, America, and Europe, which will compete in a format similar to the Global StarCraft League, which is, of course, the GSL over on GOM TV. Anyone familiar with StarCraft II will know that. Those who don't, it's pretty much considered the best league in the world. It is the league where the top-tier competitors are involved in the studio on a weekly basis, and now it will also be televised as a result of an agreement between GOM TV and the South Korean broadcast organization OGN. Now, to break this down nice and simply, Blizzard is putting a lot of money into supporting three different scenes, which will be tied together with certain partners. Korea will be done through GSL and OSL, and those tournaments will essentially become WCS. They are now one and the same. WCS America will be an online event that is hosted and run by MLG, and WCS Europe will also be an online event hosted by Intel Extreme Masters and ESL. Success in these tournaments, as well as other sanctioned events, will allow you to potentially advance to the top 16, which will get you a ticket to BlizzCon and the Global Finals, with the possibility of being crowned the World Champion. So it's a pretty hardcore set of events and designed to tie the esports scene for StarCraft 2 together in a fairly similar way to the LCS series put on by Riot. Now, this has caused, for the most part, quite a lot of rejoicing because up until this time, Blizzard has not really been involved in a big way in the esports scene for StarCraft 2, and it's mostly been left to fend for itself. Its 2012 WCS event was, for the most part, not all that good. There were some standout events, thanks to the expertise of DreamHack. WCS Europe was considered to be one of the best tournaments that year. However, the WCS Finals was, quite frankly, a goddamn disaster, and not becoming of the size of the tournament whatsoever. So it's good that they're learning from their mistakes. It's also good that they're putting a serious amount of money into this, considering that Riot has been running away with things with League of Legends lately. Now, you might say, well, isn't it bad that they're putting a ton of money and kind of artificially inflating the scene? Well, the thing is that they're not really artificially inflating the scene at all. Some might argue that when Riot started paying huge amounts of money into the esports scene for League of Legends, they were artificially inflating a scene that otherwise did not exist, and without them, that scene would cease to exist. Now, of course, that's still currently a possibility, with LCS being such an important tournament, with teams actually being salaried by Riot. Yeah, they're pretty much tied to Riot's success. If Riot goes under, then the whole bloody thing does as well. Blizzard, on the other hand, has been pretty hands-off with all of this stuff, and as a direct result, You've had numerous organizations, including MLG, DreamHack, NASL, IPL, which is sadly now deceased, as well as IEM and a whole series of other tournaments in the West, as well as, of course, the Pro League and the GSL, GSTL and OSL over in South Korea. These have all popped up and they've done so without being paid huge amounts of money by Blizzard in order to make this happen. MLG recently announced that they were actually in profit, which is fairly impressive considering that esports is kind of a black hole in which people toss money and hope for the best. Now, this also means that there are renewed possibilities for foreigners in their own regions. However, South Korean players, who are usually considered to be the best in the world, and, well, they are for the most part, 
will be allowed to compete in the WCS American WCS Europe tournaments, assuming that they signed up for the entire year and are willing to either relocate to those countries or play across region, which of course gives them a latency disadvantage as well as a really bad time schedule. So I would expect a few Koreans to pop up in WCS America and WCS Europe. We'll see if that actually ends up happening. And the majority will be playing in WCS Korea. Now, there has been some consternation amongst South Korean players that this may lead to a reduction overall Korean events. The GSL and the OSL are putting on one less tournament each this year. So that could potentially be a problem. Although there's also been some speculation that the additional funding from Blizzard will allow GOM TV as well as OGN to put on additional side events to cater to the Korean market. So overall, this is a fairly exciting time for StarCraft 2 Esports. It's also a good time to get involved and get watching because there will be a free stream available on Twitch TV for WCS Korea, which of course used to be the GSL. So a free 720 stream of the GSL is actually huge news for StarCraft fans considering that is just completely unheard of. So I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes. Obviously, as someone that sponsors a team, this is kind of a big deal for us but we will find out if this ends up being good or not. It does seem like a good show of support from Blizzard, quite frankly, and it seems like the way they've tied it together is good. I'm a little worried for organizations that weren't involved, like, say, DreamHack and NASL. Those are perhaps two of the largest organizations in Europe and America, respectively. They have not been included in this, although there is the possibility that they will be given WCS points that they will be able to give out in their tournaments. So you'll be able to travel to those tournaments to acquire points for the global finals and rankings and so on and so forth. We'll see where that goes. There's some doubt that IEM is the right decision for WCS Europe. A lot of people are saying, oh, we should get DreamHack to do it. They have a proven track record, and they do in terms of tournaments. They have certainly done better than IEM, in my opinion, but they don't have a proven track record in terms of studio work. They don't actually have a studio, whereas ESL and IEM certainly do, and they've been doing a bang-up job of the European League of Legends events lately in their studio, so I would say that they do have something of a proven track record in that regard. Anyway, exciting news for StarCraft 2 Esports, and this will be a perfect time, of course, for you to jump in and watch that. I'll actually be casting an event today and a couple more events over the next couple of days from home. That is the Acer Team Story Cup, which you can go and check out over on my Twitch.tv channel, twitch.tv slash Total Biscuit. That is on the 4th of April at 1700 Central European time. That should be... 4 o'clock in the afternoon in the UK, that should be 11 a.m. if I remember correctly, assuming that we're not messing around with daylight savings. Yeah, that should be 11 a.m. on the east coast of the US, 8 a.m. on the west coast. You can figure it out from there. And if you miss it, don't worry, I'll be putting the VODs over on YouTube.com slash Total Biscuit. That is YouTube.com slash Total Biscuit, my StarCraft 2 channel. Thank you very much for watching, folks. The content patch is back for the foreseeable future. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time.